and my name is Tim, and we're so thankful you came to worship with us this morning at Luther Memorial Church. <laughs> Have a great day! Bye! Bye! Bye. Bye. Hi, we're your acolytes for this week. I'm Ethel. And I'm Lauren. In Psalm 36, we read, In your light we see lights. Hello, I'm Pastor Lindsay, and I'm glad to be with you in worship today, this second Sunday of Lent. As we continue through our Lenten journey together, we remember that again and again, life's griefs and challenges find us. But again and again, God is faithful. Just like God was faithful to Noah and his wife, Naama, to Abraham and his wife, Sarah, God is faithful and present to us and made known to us in the person of Jesus. Will you join with me now in our prayer of confession? Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return now to the one who is full of compassion. Fountain of living water, pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood and make us alive in the spirit to follow in the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Now, beloved of God, hear this good news. God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven and God remembers them no more. Journey now in the way of Jesus. Amen.
Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mountain fixed upon it Mount of God, redeeming love. Hi, everyone. Hi. What? What? You can't hear me? Oh no, you missed out on the best news ever. Ah. <sighs> uh, well, what do you think I said? <laughs> I didn't say that. You think I said hi? How are you? Because that's how people normally start a conversation. Are you pretty sure you know what I might say? Or are there? So I wonder. I wonder if there are times. When you think you know what somebody's going to say before they say it, and so you don't really pay attention. Or I wonder if there's times when your family members or teachers tell you to listen because they don't want you to miss something. Jesus' disciples were not always the best listeners, and sometimes he had to repeat himself over and over again when they weren't listening. In today's Bible story, God finally told them something outright. God said, this is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Sometimes we don't always listen as closely as we should because we're distracted by something else or maybe we think we know what somebody's going to say already or maybe we're just not paying attention. But when we don't listen to someone important in our life, like a family member, a sibling, a parent, a teacher, we miss out. Just like they would miss out if they weren't listening to you. They might not be telling us exciting news, or, but they might be. And they might be telling us exciting news and giving us good instructions, important information. We also need to listen to God's word and to the things that Jesus said and things that God spoke through the prophets and the things that Holy Spirit is still speaking to our hearts today. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wonder what God is speaking to your heart this Lent. And I wonder if you will pray with me. <laughs> Lucy's feeling a little busy and not wanting to listen, so. That's okay, but maybe you'll pray with me. The Lord be with you. Dear God, thank you for all the ways you speak to us through other people, through your word, and through our own hearts. Help us to listen carefully. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh! You wanna know what my news was? It wasn't the truth. I said that I bought a shark yesterday for a pet. That would be funny. Mm. Would you like a pet shark? The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark in the eighth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. Jesus said all this quite openly. And Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, Jesus, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are set in your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Jesus called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, 
let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Dear friends, grace to you and peace from our loving and forgiving God. Amen. The poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, in a poem entitled The Rainy Day, wrote, Into each life some rain must fall. Some days must be dark and dreary. Those melancholy words are a reminder that life will have loss and grief, disappointment and hurt. Again and again, along the way in life, in every life, there will be bad news and things we wish we didn't have to hear, things we wish we didn't have to experience. Now, it happens that my work direction in life went in such a way that I've spent a lot of my life working around bad news. I've spent a lot of my life being around times when people were sometimes having the worst day of their life, whether in emergency rooms or disaster response. And I've seen people have any kind of response to the worst day of their life. People can respond in any way imaginable, and they deserve to when you're going through the worst day of your life. I've learned a little along the way about the sharing of bad news. There is no way to make bad news somehow good. You can't even make bad news in any way better. But I've learned along the way that you can make the sharing of bad news a more humane experience by following some important principles. We actually teach these to healthcare professionals like physicians who unfortunately sometimes have to deliver bad news. The principles are that one, when you have to deliver bad news, don't sugarcoat it. Remember, you don't make bad news better by how you say it. Two, when you have to deliver bad news, without being abrupt, you have to get to the bad news. Don't hold off till the end of a conversation. When someone has to deliver bad news, we coach them to start by saying something like this. I'm very sorry that what I have to share today is bad news. Then pause and without being abrupt, Get, get, and, but, but getting to the point, share the bad news. In our gospel reading for today, Jesus actually exhibits the principles of sharing bad news the best way possible. It reads that Jesus began to teach the disciples that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. The gospel says that Jesus said all this quite openly. He had bad news to share, and he said it plainly and openly. He got to that bad news. And it definitely was not what the disciples wanted to hear. Peter was so upset that he took Jesus aside and rebuked him, but Jesus did not back off his message. Now, I actually want to cut the disciples some slack on this. Because just like all the other times I have seen people hearing upsetting news, just like all the times in my life when I have received bad and upsetting news, when people hear upsetting news, they get upset. They should get upset. They deserve it. If this was the very first time the disciples were hearing from Jesus, this clear message that their beloved teacher was going to suffer and be killed. And he was saying it all quite plainly. They're going to be upset. I think even hearing the part where he said, must suffer and be killed and on the third day rise again, they may not have even heard that part because it just didn't make any sense. 
they were upset. They deserve to be. When people are upset, time and time again, I will hear them say, why? The word why? I've heard that word so many times and it is an unanswerable question. You don't try to answer it. You just try to be present to people asking it and give them space to ask it. And you know, theologians over many centuries have debated why did Jesus have to, have to suffer and die? What, is the, what, are the, what does it mean, the crucifixion, the resurrection? All those debates are really just an academic version of that same question. Why? Why did Jesus have to suffer and be killed and rise again? What is the meaning of it? I'll tell you that despite all the classes on systematic theology that I've ever taken, all the books I've ever read over the years, I just don't understand what it's all about. I'm nowhere closer to understanding why Jesus had to suffer and die and rise again. I don't understand what it's all about, why it had to happen the way it did. And all the times when I have sat with people on the worst day of their life, experiencing their asking of the question why, none of that study that I, I did before about systematic theology ever gave me anything smart to say. And the word why really just needs to be asked. Why? I don't know. I would say that while I don't understand what the crucifixion and the resurrection are all about, spending so much time around bad news, spending so much time around the asking of that question, why? I do understand one part of why Jesus chose to suffer and die and rise again. Because he makes it clear that this was all something he chose to do. At least one part of it is that when we are in the middle of the worst day of our life, when we do get bad news, when our hearts are breaking, that we're not going anywhere, that he isn't already there. That's the power of God's covenant. Again and again, God never breaks God's promises. Even though God's people may wander, even though we wander far away, God never stops searching and finding us and gathering us in. No matter how far we wander, wherever we have wandered to, God's already there. Our church year, beginning in Advent and Christmas and then moving into Lent, you know, as we are right now, it's kind of an annual reenactment of Jesus being born into this world of sorrow, living in this world of sorrow and teaching in this world of sorrow and then suffering and being killed and rising again. You know, we, we reenact it every year. It happened exactly one time. But the church year helps us experience it again and again. Because experiencing it again and again helps to remind us that Jesus chose to be present in this world of pain so that we can remember again and again in our times of pain and darkness that he was there before we even got there. I'm going to close with some words by the preacher and activist William Sloan Coffin, who pastored New York City's Riverside Church Coffin suffered the death of his son, Alexander, in a tragic car crash in 1983. He preached the eulogy at his own son's funeral. And this funeral sermon that he gave actually became, I think, perhaps the most well-known sermon because it says something so poignant about where God is when we are having the worst days of our lives. He said, The one thing that should never be said when someone dies is, it is the will of God. Never do we know enough to say that. My own consolation lies in knowing that it was not the will of God that Alex die. That when the waves closed over the sinking car, God's heart was the first of all our hearts to break. Amen. <music>
On this second Sunday in Lent, let us pray for the Church and for all people in need, responding to each petition with the words, Hear us, we pray. God of mercy and might, bless your Church throughout the world. Uphold those believers who suffer for the sake of your gospel. Strengthen the faith of all the baptized and make your presence felt by those unable to assemble for worship. When we cry out, O thankful God, hear us, we pray. Bless the earth, save the animals and their habitats from wild and uncontrolled weather. Teach humanity to live respectful of nature and to join in tending to creation's well-being. We ask you to smile also on Mars. When we cry out, O wondrous God, hear us, we pray. Bless the nations of the world. Raise up advocates for peace and justice within and between nations. Give life where hope seems dead. Call into existence new realities we cannot even imagine. Lead all people around the world to receive the COVID-19 vaccine with gratitude to you. Grant to our policymakers the wisdom and the will to improve the lives of all our residents. When we cry out, O righteous God, hear us, we pray. Bless all who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. We beg that you bring an end to the pandemic. Restore medical systems and comfort all who are sick or dying. Lead us out of the practices of discrimination. Bring vindication for victims of injustice and relief to oppressed minorities. When we cry out, O benevolent God, hear us, we pray. Bless families, those in our communities, those waiting at national borders, those whose struggles are known only to you. Keep children safe. Accompany everyone who lives alone. Equip the ministries and services of church and state that attend to families in their need. When we cry out, O loving God, hear us, we pray. Fill each one of us with hope and receive our personal prayers that are on our hearts and our minds. <clears throat> when we cry out, O gracious God, hear us, we pray. Praises to you, O God, for centuries of saints whose faithfulness inspires our Lenten journey. Bless those who mourn, be our way, our truth, our life, and strengthen our faith in the gift of your final salvation. When we cry out, O everlasting God, hear us, we pray. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Good morning. My name is Christine Shaw. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. May the peace of Christ be with you. We are grateful today for your offering, for the many ways that you give and you serve God and one another. We are so grateful. Your generosity sustains this ministry and the way that you extend generosity to this congregation and to the wider community is evidence of God's love and presence in this world and we are so very grateful. Let us now continue with communion. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, blessed it and broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you, do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks and he gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Gathered into one by God's Holy Spirit, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This morning we come to the table and we remember that in life and in death, we belong to God. In joy and in sorrow, we belong to God. We come to this table knowing all of who we are comes with us and God looks on us with compassion. So no matter your story or joy or struggle or grief, you are welcome at this table, whatever it looks like in your own home, because God is here and this is God's table. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Please come. This is the body of Christ given for you, and this is the blood of Christ shed for you. challenges of life are not always easy and so often we forget that through it all you are right there at our side. Make yourself alive to us. Make your presence among us awaken and enliven all that you envision for us that we may be faithful to you and the generations to come. In Jesus name we pray. Amen.
Now receive this final blessing. As you leave this space, may your mouth speak of God's goodness. May your arms hold those who are in need. May your feet walk towards justice. May your heart trust its worth. May your soul dance in God's grace. And may this be your rhythm again and again and again until God's promised day. In the name of the lover, the beloved, and love itself, go with courage, go with heart, go with peace. Amen. Hello, we're the Hilliards, Marjorie and James. We hope you have a wonderful and blessed week. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Be safe, well, and hopeful.